Welcome to our latest webinar with CARE Philadelphia. My name is Timothy Welbeck. I am the civil rights attorney for the Philadelphia chapter of CARE. And I am pleased to be joined today by Representative Joanna McClinton. She represents the 191st District of Pennsylvania. That includes Delaware and Philadelphia counties. She's held that seat since August of 2015. And in that position, she has been a fierce and relentless advocate for justice and equity for all of Pennsylvania citizens. Um, prior to that, she was an esteemed uh, attorney with public defender, minister of the gospel, and a friend and colleague of mine. And so I'm um, Joanna, woman of many hats. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us today. Glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah, so like I was mentioning before, it's a pleasure to have you. I'm really inspired by the work that you're doing and have been doing, particularly in this moment. There's been so much conversation around the need to reform um, both our criminal justice system and the way in which our society does policing. And you've been at the forefront of doing that in Pennsylvania with a couple of key pieces of legislation recently. So I'd like to talk to you about that. I'd like to begin with Act 53, is that that's okay? Um, Absolutely. So for our, our viewers who might be unaware, could you tell us what Act 53 does um, and what is the intended impact of the, of the uh, now law because it's been signed? Absolutely. So first of all, Tim, thank you for this opportunity to come to care today and talk. And of course, some folks will see this a little bit later. And thank you, especially to your executive director, Jacob Bender, for all of the leadership you do uh, care, whether you're in the Harrisburg State Capitol or in City Hall or in our communities, your work is significant serving a, a large portion of the Muslim community. It is tremendous to have this partnership and be here this afternoon. So in terms of Act 53, that is a new uh, part of the criminal justice reform package that we have been working on in Harrisburg. Um, Act 53 uh, is was, excuse me, Senate Bill 637, and it's from uh, members in the Senate, both DeSanto and Schwenk. And this bill is able to give people who previously were, uh, you know, precluded from applying for one of the 29 licensure board licensees because of a felony conviction or because of a blanket characterization called moral turpitude. Um, they were no, they were not able to get even something like a barber's license or a cosmetology license or a mortician license to be a funeral director because of their past. And as a former public defender, and of course you're an attorney, so you know very well, Tim, many times people on the outside say people have made a mistake, but we both know that um, unfortunately the justice system at times makes mistakes. And these have mistakes are costly um, costly to the point of not even allowing people to work and support themselves and their family. So this bill gives a pathway, um, especially for barbers and cosmetologists and other uh, professional licensee holders to be able to get those occupational licenses with less barriers and less restrictions. It in fact amends the Criminal History Record Information Act which uh, used to require that boards only uh, withhold licenses for convictions that are related to the practice of the occupation. Uh, but now it's different. There are over 30 fields that require a government license or registration in Pennsylvania. And under current law, people who used to be hindered and denied licenses, which was a waste, of course, of taxpayer dollars, because sometimes they got licenses while they were confined in state correctional institutions. Now they're required to publish regulations and explain how it will be applied in specific professions. So that means that uh, folks who have criminal records and um, they are going to now have fair, consistent opportunities and individual considerations um, in terms of whether or not they can get a license that they're applying to receive. That's excellent for all the reasons that you mentioned and particularly one of the things that jumps out to me is like what you said before and that people make mistakes and oftentimes our criminal justice system is unforgiving 
And so if you come out with a felony conviction, it's oftentimes difficult to re-enter society and to earn a respectable living. And so that often leads to, people, to high rates of recidivism for people who can't legitimately work. So it's, it's, it's great that you and your colleagues have helped open up these avenues to people. Can you talk about some of the process of getting that passed? I know that it was not easy to get some of your colleagues on board to convince them that this was a good opportunity for Pennsylvanians. So I have to shout out my colleagues in the House because representatives Jordan Harris, Jordan is the whip of the Democratic caucus. He serves South Philly and a small part of Southwest. Uh, Jordan Harris and Cheryl Delosier, who's in Cumberland County, uh, both of those state reps had this same language as a bill in Harrisburg, but unfortunately, theirs did not get across the finish line. And they introduced it over a year ago. So many times on the outside, um, you know, our neighbors and sometimes critics will say, oh, they're not doing anything in Harrisburg. But they don't realize what type of sacrifices have to be made um, when you have a great legislative idea all the stakeholders are not going to be supportive. So you have to make the determination of what type of compromises you can make um, so that stakeholders will support it and so that it will move. Because even when House Democrats are in charge, hopefully um, in a few months, <laughs> we're still going to have to make concessions. We're still going to have to make compromises. And this is one piece of legislation that required a lot of compromise, but I'm so glad it is now law in Pennsylvania. Yes, you, you and me both, like, like I said, it's, it's such an important moment for people to be able to re-enter society because hopefully that will, we will return to this idea of incarceration being rehabilit uh, rehabilitative and uh, punitive. And so this is a great opportunity to reduce that stigma for people and to just help Pennsylvanians um, live together uh, more equitably. Um, you've been a part of some other important legislation too. So criminal justice has been at the forefront of people's minds uh, of late, but also police reform too. It's the, the whole, I guess, Black Lives Matter era has centered policing and police brutality, but particularly this spring has reinvigorated a lot of attention to policing and just the way in which our society allows police to use force and authority. And you were a part of two, um, also key pieces of legislation that are now law too, that, that help reform our policing. Um, can you tell me a little bit about HB 1841? Absolutely. So um, we know that Black Lives Matter has been over 10 years yes. um, in the works. Uh, some, for some people, it's a new notion, a new concept, but uh, from the acquittal um, of Trayvon Martin's murderer, that Black Lives Matter movement was birthed, be able to speak to whether it is police brutality or clearly racistly, racist incidents that have led to the deaths of black and brown people, um, to be able to speak to that and to be able to combat you know, the hatred that it's rooted in. And unfortunately, the laws that allow uh, these activities to be sanctioned and these killers to go free and of course, you know, with over 90 days um, of us staying in place, we had to suffer through the brutal murders of our sister, Breonna Taylor, and our brother, George Floyd. And as a result of, you know, people not working, many of them, sadly, but also being in the house, um, not able to go anywhere, uh, whether it's to something social or to something spiritual, um, people took to the streets in a major way. And I love your background, Tim, oh, um, you. because what we are seeing happening in 2020 is what, you know, started in, I won't say started, but is what occurred in the 50s and the 60s. Yes. And this energy is bringing about change. This energy is so contagious that on June the 8th, my colleagues in the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus stormed the rostrum of the speaker for session and um, would not allow the speaker to come up and begin session. Uh, we staged a 90 minute protest um, on the floor of the house and the speeches were given one after the next demanding that the 
speaker who's in the majority party move our police reform bills and two bills. And the first one is House Bill. It creates for the first time a um, database which requires thorough background of police officers prior to their hiring. It requires that the Attorney General, General in Pennsylvania maintain this confidential database. We were hoping it could be public, but once again, the concessions we had to make. Yes. It is a private database that only police chiefs and their hiring departments have access to. But it will be requiring all hiring uh, police departments in the Commonwealth. And we have over a thousand because of so many small towns and municipalities. They have to go through this database. For those who recall, on June 19th of 2018, 16-year-old Antoine Rose was shot in the back by an officer who had just been dismissed from the University of Pittsburgh Police Department less than 60 days before getting hired by uh, another Pittsburgh Police Department. And then, unfortunately, executing bad judgment, excessive force, and killing Antoine Rose. So we're hoping that this database prevents those types of incidents because for the first time in Pennsylvania, municipal police departments will have to use it and look and see what's in this officer's work and employment history. Now, in order to make it better, we're asking municipalities and local governments to do their part to strengthen the local rules around policing and their contract and what's in their employment record what is versus what's kept out of it. That's, that's really important. And I'm, and I'm glad that you even put this within the context of the movements towards change, because one of the things I thought about when you and your colleagues had staged that protest was that you all were fostering good trouble. And we, we as a nation are mourning the, the loss of, of John Lewis and his towering legacy. And in many ways, you're continuing that by putting yourself on the front line and making sure that the voices of Pennsylvania's most marginalized and vulnerable citizens are heard and, and taking different measures to ensure that they're protected. Because you're exactly right. Regrettably, many times when police officers engage in excessive forms of um, use of force and abuse, they often have a record that predates that. And, and the, the complaints of people had not been heard. And so this hopefully will be a means of which to mitigate the, the, the presence, I guess, of bad apples, as people like to colloquially say. Um, you also were a part of another uh, piece of legislation too, HB 1910, I think was really important too, um, talking about officers' mental health. Uh, can you share a little bit about that as well? Absolutely. So House Bill 1910 was offered by Representative Dan Williams, who's also a member of clergy, and he represents Chester County. He's in his first term from out of Coatesville. And this bill requires uh, both mandatory training and um, child abuse, recognizing and reporting it, interacting with individuals of diverse background. So we've heard a lot lately about implicit bias, how everybody has it, even the most open among us who we say, oh, I'm not racist, I'm not classist. Like everybody has biases just because we're humans and we have adapted to our environments, so whatever they are. But when you have a badge and a gun, we want to make sure that your implicit biases are left on a shelf and don't come with you when you put that badge and gun on. Additionally, it requires that officers have access to mental health evaluations and that as a condition of continued employment, officers must undergo uh, mental health screenings for post-traumatic stress disorder um, and that if it is um, within the use of lethal force, that within 30 days that they must have a PTSD screening. Um, so many professions uh, cause a lot of stress, regardless of whether you're talking about lawyering or even yes. people who are full-time in ministry and clergy. These are frontline jobs where you are dealing with other people's problems and issues. And being an officer is no different. While we are demanding the best, are not biased, they also need to have access and better access across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to screenings to make sure that if they have in endured PTSD, that they can get treatment. I'll give one incident and we can yes. move on. Um, there was a sorry, sad situation in my community within the last nine months. 
where in one household an entire family was murdered. Mm. It was right here in the 18th district. And so this is what we're just responding to. We haven't heard anything in this house for a couple of days. They stumbled upon that horrible scene. And I mean, I can't imagine. I have never seen anything like that. But that is that is stress. That is trauma. They need to be able to get screenings. And they also need to make sure that if they're taking better care of including their mental health, not just physical, that they can do their job in a better way. That's, that's a great way to look at how um, police officers are people and that they require certain levels of services to be able to effectively perform their job. A lot of the national conversation is kind of picking up on um, some of the some of the uh, rhetoric of the black feminist movement of the last 40, 50 years about defunding the police or even going as far as to abolishing the institution of policing. You obviously haven't arrived there. Can you talk to me about how you arrived at a place of seeing the balance of the need for critical reforms while also maintaining the institution of policing um, in Pennsylvania for um, your constituents? So I have not gotten even just ideolo ideologically to the idea of abolishing police. Mm -hmm. I do think that when we say defunding the police, unfortunately it's misinterpreted yes. as abolishing the police and that is not what it means. It simply means reallocating funding and rethinking the way policing happens. So I'm a part of the police. In addition, my council member where I live in West Philly, Jamie Gaudier, has convened a group of young people where I'm a member uh, of this group where we listen to young adults in our neighborhoods and meet with top brass in law enforcement. We just had another meeting on Sunday. And these young people, to be clear, they're you know 18, 21, 23 years old. And we're talking to our inspector about the way policing happens. We all realize that police are overutilized. They're used for things that are not dangerous situations. They're used for things that are not uh, situations that police should be called in. I, and four police had to try to get the windows open just so he could go in the house and hopefully sober up. We don't need police to respond to situations like that where someone is not violent or putting themselves or anyone else in immediate danger. We had a young person share how a police officer arrived to a scene of someone who was having a psychotic break. What if we had social workers, yes. therapists, drug and alcohol counselors able to respond to these situations so not only can someone get in their house but they also can know how to lean a little bit less on any substance and be able to stand on their feet and face the storms of life because after those officers you know got the neighbor in the house they kept on going for the rest of their calls that night and who knows what dangerous situation they were delayed in responding to because they were literally trying to interact with someone who could to rethink the way policing happens and be able to change the way our resources are spent because that is money that could be spent in a better manner. I'm, I'm so glad that you clarified that because many people um, have trepidation when they hear the language of defund the police and they don't realize, as you said, it's about the notion of we ask police officers to do too much. If someone breaks into your home, if you lock yourself out of your home, if someone's having a mental out of your car. If you get out of your car, if a homeless person is loitering, people call the same person and or the same institution and it's putting too much stress on police officers. And so there are better means to meet those needs. And one of the things I tell people all the time is we've already defunded the police and that we have emergency medical training, uh, tra uh, technicians, I'm sorry. And so like EMTs, um, the people who drive our ambulances, they're doing the work that we were asking police officers to do in the 70s. And we realized that there are, there's a better means in which to handle medical emergencies and allow police officers to handle other facets of society. And the conversation around defunding the police is exactly that, it's saying to continue that conversation and saying that are there other things that we're asking police officers to do that they should not. It's, re it's really great that you're having that conversation with young people 
in the community because oftentimes they're not heard in these conversations. Can you talk to me a little bit about like some of the things that you've heard or, or some of the ways in which they want to see change in their neighborhoods and in their communities? So to be clear, this uh, new work group came about because um, the Sunday of the, the massive protests and of course other people decided to riot and to loot businesses. But that Sunday, I believe it was May 31st, um, my police captain at where I live in the 18th district called me and said, you know, there's some young people who are protesting. They're not causing problems, but the curfew is starting soon and they're telling us we're not leaving. He said, you know, our councilwoman is here. Can you join her to talk to them just to see what it will take for them to just go home safely so there's no violence? Um, and of course, when, when he didn't say that, I don't want to quote him, but I mean, that was what I got out of it. They didn't yeah. want to have any, any victims of, of violence. And we know what happens in tense situations where they're standing off between police who are in riot gear and, and humans and citizens. We've seen it time and time again. And I definitely wanted to avoid that. So when I got to 52nd and Chestnut where they were, you know, I just started talking to the young people, asking them, why are you all here? What do you want to see happen? What do you want to see as an outcome? And some of them were saying, you know, we want to talk to the mayor. We want Jim Kenney to come here right now. We want him to explain why there's police brutality in West Philadelphia. And they were so passionate and so straightforward, sharing story after story of things that have happened on their blocks or with them, how they've been pulled up, how they've been harassed, how it's not right, it's wrong. And I felt, you know, their fury and their, their righteous indignation. And so, um, you know, when I began to continue the conversation and asking them, well, what do you want to be the outcome if we can't get the mayor here tonight? You know, they said, we want to be able to sit down and let our voices be heard. We want a meeting. So I said, well, we can meet, you know, <laughs> Jamie and I are working remotely. You know, we can do Zoom. We can find a big place to do it in person so we can spread out. And so the next Sunday we had the first meeting and we were at 52nd and Pine in a co-working space where the, the meeting was Honestly, Tim, four hours. Uh, <laughs> our inspector was there, a deputy commissioner was there, a lieutenant was there, and they literally poured out, you know, their frustration and their disappointment with the way policing happens in Philadelphia. And from that meeting, you know, we decided to take action steps. Like, what can we do? with your voices to influence a change. So we decided to have monthly meetings. And with this second meeting, we decided to make some priorities. So one of them, the young people want to ensure that going forward, and of course these don't change immediately, but you know, Jamie's working on local legislation, I'm working on state legislation, is to change the way policing happens in schools. So not having the police arrest our children with all of these incidents. One of the young adults just graduated 12th grade. She's starting college in a few weeks. And she said this school year, one of her teachers accidentally cut her with scissors. She didn't get into how it happened, but she explained that she at 18 saw the politics of you're okay. You don't need to press charges. Everything is all right from the teachers and the school administration. And she knew that if it had been the other way around, the other way around, she would have left the building, gone right off to family court, maybe spent some nights at the juvenile justice center. And she understood that that dynamic, that power dynamic, and the power structure, and the way kids in school are over police, it needs to change. So that's one of several things that we are talking about. And also moving forward with rethinking what types of legislation do we need. How do we incorporate the, the stakeholders, the teachers union, and God forbid, the police union at the table to listen and really respond? So it's been a, a great ongoing conversation. You know, we're straightforward in that talk. You know, when we hear one policing perspective, I share how I was stopped outside my house um, and told I pulled over erratically and why did I stop there? I live here. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> Why is your music up so loud? It's a favorite song. Why are you driving <laughs> like that? Well, I've been in the house three weeks and haven't driven my car. You know, so you start to share stories like that. And even our law enforcement members who are here are like, you know, that sounds like over-policing. That sounds like it's condescending. That sounds like it's been a disrespectful situation. So this is ongoing and, and the fight uh, continues even with what we did in Harrisburg. We consider that, you know, baby steps in terms of what needs to happen with getting rid of qualified immunity, with yes. getting rid of the use of force defense that kind of covers all actions and always gets officers acquitted. That, I'm so glad that you shared that, especially because to have a representative share stories of racial profiling and to listen, I'm sure it was powerful. I, I often share with our constituents, it's like when we talk about these things, they're, they're important to me, not just because of the justice, but also I know what it's like. I've been pulled over in every state that I've driven in. Uh, and when I lived in Georgia, I got pulled over 22 times in 19 months. It got to the point that my mom said, baby, if you're not going to work or church, I need you to stay in the house. And so we, we uh, acutely understand and, and, and feel that. And so um, you've been very gracious with your time. If you don't mind me asking you like another question or two. Um, sure. you, you mentioned um, ending qualified immunity and the use of force defense. Can you talk a little bit about that and or what you foresee as the next horizon and some of the work that you're doing right now? Absolutely. So um, qualified immunity, in case anyone has not heard that term and is not clear on what it means, it is what shields police officers and other officials from being held personally liable for constitution viola constitutional violations against citizens. For example, the right to be free from excessive police force uh, or they are for money damages under federal law so long as the official did not violate clearly established laws. So if we as citizens do anything, we are personally liable. So if I'm in my car and I hit you, Tim, you mm -hmm. can sue me. My insurance company will say, well, Joanna, you messed up. You're liable, but this insurance will cover whatever you owe. But people acting in official capacity, like police officers, they never face any personal liability for the decisions they make on the job. And in some ways, that's good because you say, well, they're bold and brave folks to want to come out and combat crime. But on other ways, when you look at the fact that so many incidents are, are um, aggressive, so many incidents are unnecessarily violent, you start to wonder what needs to happen so that we see a little less of that. And I don't mean less of policing because we need, you know, bad actors to be arrested. We need them to be held accountable. We need them to, as you said, have rehabilitatory time away, whether it's in prison or probation or whatever it needs to be so that they can get on the right track. But the things that we're protesting about and that we're working on this legislation to address are not for that. They're for other situations where authorities just abuse. And I think that it goes to the root and core and history of policing and an us versus them. You know, the whole prison industrial system came at the end of slavery. Yes. So we can't have slaves anymore. So what do you want to do now? Mm -hmm. mm, how about we create prisons? How about we create crimes? How about we create police forces? And you don't believe me, you can take time to look it up. But that's with qualified immunity. So that's something that we want to do. And then in terms of uh, the use of force, that is a bill that my colleagues, Representative Summer Lee and Representative Ed Ganey, both from Allegheny County, have a bill on limiting the use of force in incidents with police and making sure there's not an overall defense so that like that officer who killed um, Antoine Rose was acquitted. He went to trial, but he was acquitted because the law is vague. It says, oh, well, if you feel threatened and you're feeling danger, then you can use force. And that's it, like period, as all the younger people say, period. No, nothing else, no commas, no semicolon, no if and but. So we are working on that. And then the final thing I'll mention is that we're sitting down with unions across the state because we want to address Act 111. Act 111 came out in the 70s and it makes sure that both firefighters and police do not have the right to strike or protest. 
They cannot all walk off the job. So that means that God forbid there's an incident in the home and you call for a fireman, they can't say, oh, they're on strike. They don't have that right. But a part of the contract in Act 111, it says that they also can't just be terminated. They have to go through an arbitration process. And unfortunately, at least here in Philly, we have seen that arbitration process fail us yes. time and time again. I'm not going to go down the list of bad actors that we've publicly seen committing crimes against citizens going through arbitration just to get their jobs back. So we are working on that as well. It's going to be ongoing. Our session that we're in right now, it winds down in November, but we have a new speaker, Brian Cutler from Lancaster, and he has promised to continue to work on this issue this session. So we are going to push to get more bills passed before November. And then of course, when we start our next session going to 2021, Put this at the very top of the priority but we know that when you rush some ideas you know they're not well thought out and they also may have implications on other people so we don't want to begin to open up a door many people in organized labor are worried about all contracts you know coming under scrutiny and of course we're focused on policing but they're worried that conservatives which have always wanted to dismantle the right to organize will yeah. you know use this as a segue to get rid of organized labor. Yeah, th this, this was so important and I'm so glad that you offer a view of what qualified immunity is and what this use of force, um, what this use of force defense is, and just ways in which you're untangling that because one of the many frustrations that people have had is how can you watch Michael Rosenfeld, Rosefeld shoot Antoine Rose in the back? And we understand intuitively as people that it's wrong to shoot someone in the back and it's, he can go to trial and he can walk away free. And, and so you, you explained that beautifully and working diligently to dismantle these types of overprotections that harm everyday citizens. And that's one of the things I wanted to conclude with. I, earlier I mentioned this whole idea that you're continuing in the legacy of people like John Lewis and that you're, you're stirring up good trouble. And um, one of the things, if you don't mind, if you could just talk about how you're a woman of faith, uh, you're a minister of the gospel, and how your faith often informs a lot of this work that you're doing, and how even you go about doing the work that you're doing, not just that you do it, but how you do it as well. I was wondering if you would be willing to just talk about how your faith informs the work that you do. Absolutely. So I am so grateful to be able to be positively influenced and see the impact figures like uh, Congressman John Lewis made in America. You think about a young boy who grew up in the worst of segregation, Jim Crow era. Who would ever think that this gentleman would go all the way to spending decades in the nation's capital to frame laws so that they never are like they were when he was having to march the streets, when he was on the Edmund Pettus Bridge getting his literally his brains beat out where he left with a fractured skull. And to see that type of bravery is similar to me at least to read through figures and fighters in the Bible. Whether I'm thinking about Moses who told Pharaoh to let his people go or Esther who went to the king without an invitation and said, no, my people need help. I believe that my role and my faith influences me to be bold to be brave, to, to stand up regardless of what we're facing and what other people might perceive and how they may judge and walk away and make an assessment of what I'm doing. My faith tells me that as long as the Lord allows me to be in this space, I must speak up. I must make sure that I speak up until people are uncomfortable. I have to do it so that they know what is going on and what's right and what's wrong. And I just will end with, you know, the scriptures in Micah telling us to walk humbly, to love mercy and to pursue justice. That is what, you know, rad my radical Jesus did um, when he was on this earth. That's what he was doing, walking humbly, uh, loving mercy and pursuing justice looking on the downtrodden, the, the blind beggars, looking at the poor in my community, seeing how I can connect them to resources and be able to empower them so they break out of that vicious cycle, making sure that the institutions that are supposed to be doing good, like public schools, are doing that good. So 
my faith definitely spurs me to action and always encourages me when we're in down moments of history like today. Like how can, you know, our great Representative John Lewis have fought for decades and we still are having Rihanna Taylor, George Floyd. Like how is that possible? So we see that this is a relentless fight that we cannot give up on. And I'm willing to stay in the race and stay in the ring for as long as the Lord will permit. Well, thank you, Joanna. Um, you have been such a, a, a source of inspiration and you mentioned Esther and similarly to Esther, you were raised up for such a time as this. And we're grateful to have leadership from people like you who are fearless and courageous and are willing to represent those who don't have a voice, those who are vulnerable. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. And, it, and let us know how we can support you and we'll be happy to continue in lending our efforts to, to support the work that you're doing. Absolutely, and thank you for this opportunity. Everyone take care and be blessed. Thank you, you as well.